Wonderful. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Svenja Espenhan and I'm the Executive Director of Campus Alberta Neuroscience. On behalf of Campus Alberta Neuroscience, I want to welcome you all to the second iteration of the Successes in Neuroscience Symposium. This symposium is a celebration of the promising innovations in neuroscience and mental health that are happening right here in Alberta that are bringing us hope for a brighter future. And we are so excited to share these innovations with all of you today. I'm here to formally welcome you and provide a few housekeeping notes to kick us off. As we're undertaking this virtually, which I'm sure we are all fairly familiar with by now, if you should encounter any issues related to this platform, you can email us at abneuro at ucalgary.ca. We will write that email in the chat box now. Amit also recommends that you use Google Chrome on your computer for viewing. And you can also troubleshoot by refreshing the web page or switching to low definition at the bottom of your screen. There's also a support lounge where you can chat with the Amit representative for assistance. Please also note that the event will be recorded. At Campus Alberta Neuroscience, we are committed to fostering, developing, and supporting innovations that improve brain and mental health of all Albertans and beyond, and to bringing our province to the forefront of neuroscience research, education, and innovation. Our organization was established by the Alberta Neuroscience Community in 2012, with support from the government of Alberta, and it has since grown to a large and diverse provincial network of over a thousand people working passionately to advance research, train the next generation of change makers, enhance patient care, and support clinicians, healthcare workers, industry, and policymakers. Our network helps to accelerate important innovations, and to get, together with our partners, we push towards creating new ways for trainees, researchers, healthcare professionals, industry, and the public to work, learn, and innovate together to help make Alberta the epicenter for brain health. The next few hours will highlight some of the promising innovations and research into brain health from researchers and trainees at the universities of Alberta, Calgary, and Lethbridge. We have 13 incredible speakers and four exciting sessions for you today. And the program was developed with engagement in mind. So the event will follow this format. Each speaker will give a 15 minute presentation followed by five minutes of Q&A. And there will also be a 15 minute roundtable discussion at the end of each session. So we hope you brought lots of questions and gonna ask them. We have people joining us from across Canada and from a variety of backgrounds. And I hope everyone is excited to learn and be inspired. We have a great lineup of speakers for you, and I'm happy to be here with all of you to celebrate research and innovation, now more than ever. You can also follow Campus Alberta Neuroscience on our Twitter account at abneuro, as we will be live tweeting this event. And you can join in and share with us your own successes in neuroscience by using the hashtag successes in neuroscience 2022. We really would love to hear about your own successes. And now I would like to give a big thank you to all our speakers and our partners at the Hodgkiss Brain Institute, the Neuroscience and Mental Health Institute, and the Canadian Centre for Behavioural Neuroscience. I would also like to give a special thank you to the Government of Alberta and the Ministry of Advanced Education and Jobs, Economy and Innovation for supporting Campus Alberta Neuroscience all these years and showing their commitment to innovation. And with that, I'm excited to share some greetings from the Minister of Advanced Education with you now. Hi, good morning, Dimitrios Nikolaides, Alberta's Minister of Advanced Education. Thank you all for having me this morning at the Successes in Neuroscience Symposium. I, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person with all of you, but uh, happy to at least have the opportunity to send a virtual greeting. I, of course, want to extend that greeting not just on behalf of myself, but uh, on behalf of everyone here at the Government of Alberta who recognizes the incredible work that, that's happening. Uh, I just want to say quickly, the Campus Alberta Neuroscience Network uh, is an incredible partnership between the University of Calgary, the University of Alberta, and the University uh, of Lethbridge. And I want to commend all of you for the incredible partnerships that you've developed through 
this network. And I do want to say that I firmly believe that networks such as the Campus Alberta Neuroscience Network are a, a pillar and an example of what research and collaboration can look like in our post-secondary uh, community. And I think that there are uh, two strong benefits as a result of the incredible partnerships you've built. Firstly, the partnership allows you to excel in research and commercialization. And as you may know, we've recently unveiled Alberta 2030, a new 10-year strategic plan for our post-secondary system. And one of the critical goals of that strategic plan is to strengthen research and commercialization. And the work that is, uh, that is happening as a result of your uh, collaboration helps to strengthen that pillar. Secondly, the collaboration that occurs is an example of collaboration that can be replicated across the post-secondary system. Indeed, when we are able to bring more of our incredible post-secondary institutions together, as you are doing, to share best practices, share research objectives, and achieve important commercialization benchmarks, not only our, uh, are our post-secondary institutions better off, but our entire province benefits. So again, Thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. I wish you all the very best at the symposium and in your ongoing efforts. Wonderful. It's so nice to have some greetings from the minister. And now I'm very excited to introduce the moderators for this event, Pritma Chatta and Jordan Witzel. Pritma and Jordan are hosts of Now Innovating, a research to impact podcast. The podcast series aims to inspire researchers and community partners to take new steps towards transforming discoveries into solutions, products, and services by sharing experiences of change makers that have navigated the path from research to implementation and public impact. Pritma is also a nurse executive and award-winning entrepreneur. She's passionate about the behavioral health of communities and has launched her third startup, Lavender, an online psychiatry and therapy office in response to growing demands for mental health care in the wake of the pandemic. And Jordan is likely, familiar, is likely a familiar face to many of you, as he's a well-known weatherman. Beyond making people smile with his personality and original costumes, he works as a senior communication specialist at the University of Calgary and dedicates much of his personal efforts as a community advocate from projects that support mental health to efforts that raise visibility for those in the LGBTQ plus community. We are so, so happy to have Pritma and Jordan as moderators today. So please join me in welcoming them onto the virtual stage. And I hope everyone has a great day celebrating successes in neuroscience. Thank you. We've Thank got you. a whole bunch of emojis of hearts and clapping hands. So I think we're starting off on the right foot, Pritma. Mostly for you and your costumes. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be in any of the Halloween costumes today, folks. Uh, <laughs> I'll stay in my in my sport jacket and my and my shirt. But uh, it's it, we're absolutely honored to be here. Uh, Preetma and I connected. It was back in August when we first met each other, right? As yeah. we we um, launched the Now Innovating podcast through the University of Calgary, talking all things innovation. And we've had some fantastic guests straight from HBI as well that have joined our podcast at times. So we're with you all day. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to learn and grow and stretch with each of you. And I'm so proud to see the lineup and see and learn about all the work, mm -hmm. the amazing work that's being done right here in our province. It's going to be an exciting day. It sure is. It's a full day. So let's get right to it. We don't want to run too far behind uh, because there is so much to get through so many fantastic speakers. So uh, again, thank you for joining us throughout today. Our first presenter, Dr. Darren Dirksen. Dr. Dirksen obtained his undergraduate honors chemistry degree and PhD at the University of Alberta, working on the development of bioactive peptides and new synthetic methods. He then completed an Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Cambridge in the lab of Professor Ian Patterson, working on the total synthesis of pelioricide, uh, pe uh, a potent anti-cancer natural product. The Dirksen Research Group is highly collaborative and has a focus on the development of protein modulators using small molecules, particularly, particularly in the areas of pain and cancer. Everybody, Dr. Dirksen. 
All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for the uh, the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to have to ask for some help here on how to turn on the slide or whether that's visible already. We do see it now, Darren. Thanks. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, well, again, thanks a lot for the invitation to uh, come here and talk a bit about our work and the opportunity to, uh, to share what we're doing at the University of Calgary with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tuan Trang and, and Dr. Roger Thompson. Um, so I'm a chemistry professor, as was mentioned, at the U of C. I have a number of neuroscience collaborators, um, but maybe as a chemist, I have a bit of a different perspective on some of these things than other neuroscience talks you'll be seeing later today. So hopefully I can offer some different insights and uh, and some hopefully something of interest to, to other people that are interested in different questions. So uh, we're all members of the Hotchkiss Brain Institute at the U of C and, um, and co-founders of a company that we're calling um, Affiotics. And so today I'll be telling you more about our kind of our journey so far as we're really just getting going and share some of the things that, we, uh, that we've learned along the way. Uh, next slide. All right, so the uh, really the, the part of this problem of, uh, of chronic pain is, is, is a major one that affects Albertans and Canadians uh, uh, really acro and across the globe. And so it's estimated that one in five Albertans um, are, have chronic pain. And this is a, this is a major problem for our province and across the country. Um, as the direct and indirect costs of chronic pain estimated to be between 56 and $60 billion a year. Uh, but, you know, beyond just the, um, the, the financial costs, of course, you know, to the to people that are actually suffering, this has a major impact on how they can carry out their normal work um, and is one of the major uh, drivers of, of what brings people to emergency rooms across, uh, across the province. And so this is something that really needs to be addressed <clears throat> Uh, and as a, in context, it's something to keep in mind is that uh, my colleague uh, Tuan likes to say that in the U.S., uh, chronic pain affects more people than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined, which is kind of a, a staggering number of, of 100, 100 million Americans. And so this is really a, a huge problem, and this burden of pain really necessitates better therapy so that people can, can carry on with their lives. Uh, next slide, please. All right. <clears throat> um, as a chemist, I'm fascinated by compounds that come from nature and things that we can make in the lab. And so there's an entire discipline of natural products chemistry that unfortunately I don't have enough time to really tell you about today. But opium, uh, of course, many of you have heard about before. It's been used by for thousands of years by ancient Romans and Greeks and was referred to as the joy plant. Um, and many years later, in the 18, sorry, in the 1600s, uh, Sydenham's laudanum, uh, was a combination of opium, sherry wine, and herbs, and this was used as a treatment for, for just about everything that ails you. Uh, it took away the pain and it made things um, more manageable for people that were suffering. Uh, and then in the 1800s, morphine was the first active, uh, pardon me, active component of opium that was isolated from laudanum, and really this opened the Pandora's box uh, for the development of of better uh, and more powerful opioid drugs from a therapeutic perspective as chemists could now understand its chemical properties and how to modify it and how to um, really change change how it impacted the body. And so uh, today, opioids comprise about 40% of chronic pain medications, and uh, Canada is actually the, the second highest consumer of opioids. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this slide is um, slightly dated, but it does show the scope of the, the opioid crisis. And so you can see Clearly, the U.S. is one of the, the major hotspots where this is uh, opioid use um, uh, and, and, and misuse are, are really a major problem. But Canada is also, this is, this is a major problem as well as Europe and Australia and um, increasingly spreading throughout the world. Um, many people, I think, who are listening today know someone, you know, including myself, who's been impacted by opioid use disorder. So this is really a problem that affects uh, a, a lot of people around the world and unfortunately is continuing to really grow. Uh, next slide. Uh, a little bit more, but it's really uh, unfortunately centered in, in, in uh, Canada around BC and Alberta and Ontario that make up 90% of the poisoning hospitalizations involving opioids in uh, and then it's, this is particularly true in 2021 and 20, uh, in 2020, 
um, the, the, as the pandemic really amplified these problems. So in 2020, more than uh, 6,300 people um, died of opioid-related deaths uh, and opioid poisoning. And so this is, a, this is a really big problem that needs to be addressed as every year we're setting a new record and beating the previous year of how many people are, um, are dying of opioid-related uh, opioid -related deaths. Um, uh, next slide, please. All right, the, as I mentioned, the pandemic has really amplified this. There's a, a sharp increase in monthly um, overdoses. Uh, so in 2019, for every 10 suspected um, overdoses in, in 2020, or after the pandemic began, this number was now up to 14. And so this is a, a continuing increase that, uh, that, that, that continues to go on today. And accidental overdoses and challenges are, are really one of the major problems of the toxic uh, drug supply. And so one of the major culprits from the chemistry perspective um, is fentanyl. So in Canada, 87% of parent um, accidental opioid toxicity deaths involve fentanyl. And so this is, uh, this is a major problem. Clarity for middle-aged males between 20 and 49. 65% uh, of hospitalizations in 2021, so not even that long ago, um, this, this is uh, the demographic that's really being affected. So these, these numbers are, are staggering and I think it's, it's really um, puts it in perspective of how large the scale of a problem is and it's not something that only affects people you know, in the US or in other big cities, it happens right here um, in Alberta, in Calgary, in Edmonton, Grand Prairie, you know, these are all places that are being affected. And I think that really helps to keep it in context of the, the scale of the problem. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, I think some people think, well, you know, with everything we know about opioids and all the potential problems, why don't people just quit? Um, so, I, you know, that's um, unfortunately uh, an attitude that still is prevalent. You know, people, why, why, don't, why don't you just stop doing that? Um, and this is really... I think something that's not fair from the from a therapeutic perspective, um, and this you know very very difficult for people that are uh, have opioid use disorder. So there's a real physical dependence that comes with a need to take opioids, as withdrawal symptoms appear um, after um, after stopping the opioid. So by 72 hours, for example, is really the peak in the symptoms. So things like nausea, vomiting. Uh, cramps, uh, anxiety, depression. Uh, these are, are very intense and very strong um, withdrawal effects. And the experience of or, or the fear of withdrawal is really something that stops a lot of people from being able to um, uh, stop taking uh, opioids. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here's just some of actual comments that have been sent to the Trang Lab. Uh, my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Tuan Trang, uh, and I'll just encourage you to take a moment just to read over these, but I'll just highlight some of the points where, you know, these are, are not necessarily what people think of when people hear opioid use disorder. They're a healthy 62-year-old man um, trying to stop taking this medication, but the withdrawal symptoms are, are awful, and they, they feel like they have nothing to lose. You know, I can't live this way. These are really um, eye-opening, I think, and, and really... Um, show the impact of, of what it's like to try and go through this process. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, it's like the new cancer is one that really hits me, but it's because it's something that people are just not able to stop because the withdrawal symptoms are, are such a major barrier to this, to this problem. All right, uh, so is it next slide? Thank you. Yeah. So um, currently there are some, so I should, I should definitely clarify here that um, opioid, stopping the use of opioids is a very complex problem. And all, I would say one of the options is, uh, or is a pharmaceutical treatment. So as a chemist, that's the part that I'm the most familiar with and I'll be able to speak to you. But there are a number of facets that are involved here for, um, for opioid use disorder. So this is maybe, I would, I would consider it as one of the pharmaceutical options. So Currently, there are some pharmaceutical options, but there are a number of adverse effects uh, that with the current treatments. And so there are high dropout rates with current strategies, and less than 30% of patients actually achieve
Um, one of the treatment options is to put you onto another opioid. So methadone and um, uh, uh, buprenorphine, these are also opioid compounds. And so they do have different effects, but um, things like withdrawal can still be a problem and, and have some of the other issues of opioids like uh, addictive properties. Uh, there are non-opioid um, options that are, that are available, but these affect the autonomic nervous system like clonidine and lefexidine, including cardiovascular effects. And these also have withdrawal symptoms. And so there are some options that already exist, but these are, I would say, to say it nicely would be, they're far from perfect and there's a lot of room for, for improvement. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so um, shifting now to our academic research, uh, Dr. Duan Trang, one of the discoveries made in his lab that really was the, uh, kind of made a, a, a quite a breakthrough, was that uh, modulating connexin one channels that are localized in the microglia impact, have a direct impact, sorry, on, on symptoms of opioid withdrawal in preclinical models. And so in mouse and rat models, um, by blocking the, uh, the Pinexin-1 channel is able to alleviate the, the symptoms of opioid withdrawal, uh, or I should say reduce them. Uh, so this is really a, a major discovery that was published in Nature Medicine. Um, and a, a patent was filed um, to try and uh, see if we could, if, if, they, if their group could move this forward. Um, I should also say that, uh, oops, sorry, uh, still on the, yeah, okay, sorry, no, that's okay. Uh, I'm still getting used to not being able to control my own slides here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Next slide. All right, so something that was, um, that was exciting from this discovery is that there were some um, uh, drugs that have already been approved to be safe in humans that are, that have been shown to be inhibitors of Pinexin-1. And so there are some molecules you might have seen before, such as mefloquine. Uh, this is used for other purposes, uh, but it, it did show to have some impact on Pinexin-1. One of the problems, of course, with, with mefloquine, um, it is, although it's an inhibitor, it does actually have psychiatric side effects on its own that include anxiety and panic attacks and confusion. So clearly this would not be a very effective uh, therapy for treating withdrawal. Um, the 10 pan -X, that's in on the right hand side of your screen here is for the uh, is a peptide that's really used as a tool um, so not really with an eye to translation but the one that we were the most excited about particularly in the in the train lab was this probenicid which is the structure in the middle uh, probenicid is effective as a as an inhibitor of panexin one but also has an exquisite safety profile which is really exciting so the low toxicity make it something that uh, makes it very attractive as a drug and for further drug development um, and so uh, we're, we're very pleased that uh, Tuan was able to get uh, funding secured for a phase 2A clinical trial um, that will hopefully be starting later this year using uh, probenicid. And so Sorry, next slide. All right, so um, other work that, um, other important work that was being done at the University of Calgary uh, include, that involved Pinexin was actually from the, the Thompson lab. Uh, Dr. Roger Thompson's lab showed that, um, that when you block the Pinexin channel, it actually also has an impact in stroke. So if you just look at um, the data in the bottom right corner here on the right hand column, see that uh, when Pinexin is blocked by this peptide that was developed, uh, it resulted in smaller lesions from people that were undergoing stroke. And so Pinexin is a really, really interesting target that is involved in some important brain chemistry that we're still working on. Uh, this work in particular that I'm showing here was uh, published in Nature Neuroscience um, is some years ago now, I think in 2016. Um, but interestingly, it's by a different mechanism than compared to withdrawal. So this really indicates that there's some um, opportunities for future indications for this kind of a therapeutic. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and then in my lab, um, we, we recognize that there was a lot of interest in Pinexin-1 and we, uh, so we crossed paths with um, the Trang lab and the Thompson lab and we, we recognize that there was definitely uh, a need to try to make better inhibitors and better modulators of Pinexin-1. So we set out to see if we could make it better. 
And um, for those of you that are interested in medicinal chemistry <coughs> or chemistry in general, uh, we completed a structure activity relationship study, which really looks at systematically changing all the parts of the molecule with other groups to see if we can make it better. And so we uh, modified a number of lead compounds to try to evaluate them. And we developed a new compound that inhibits Panexin-1 at nanomolar concentrations. And so if you're not familiar with nanomolar concentrations, this is uh, you know, quite a low value, but maybe the more important value is it works at 100,000 times lower concentrations than probenicid as an inhibitor for Panexin-1. Um, and so that's uh, a really exciting result because it, it allows the possibility of using a much lower dose and so this is something that was explored in animal models. So um, at 50 times lower dose than probenicid in animal models, um, it showed the same effect of alleviating withdrawal. And so this is really, um, we think is a really exciting result and, um, and uh, a patent was filed and a publication will hopefully be coming out soon. And we really are working toward trying to move this forward so that it can, uh, can actually reach patients. And, uh, and this is the process to do that with um, help from HBI and the University of Calgary in particular. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk more about that, but I'll, I'll skip the chemistry lecture for today. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so given our interest in, in trying, um, I have a, just a, you know, a, few, a few slides to talk about for other researchers in particular that are interested. So. Uh, we started off in our collaboration with um, Innovate Calgary, which is the kind of technology development office at the University of Calgary. And a big thanks to them for helping us to uh, help secure the initial patents and to get off the ground. Um, we did explore some licensing opportunities along the pathway. We also tried to seek investors on our own um, as, as, uh, as research faculty with intellectual property for new compounds. Um, in particular, but really this was not successful, um, if I'm honest, because we really needed more business expertise and we really needed a better IP strategy. Um, investors are are very focused, you know, and we needed the resources of the investor in, in the investors in order to really do take all of the next steps, like you know, facing clinical trials and further development, Health Canada approvals, and all of that process along the way requires significant resources. So we really recognize the need for for partnerships. Um, uh, in order to actually be able to move something to the clinic where we could actually help people. And we really needed the resources of, of industry. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we decided to combine the expertise around Panexin. Um, so all of us had a, had a similar interest in Panexin 1 in the Trang lab, in the Thompson lab, and in my lab. Um, so we decided to all kind of uh, pool our efforts and resources and work together. Uh, we had a lot of discussions with advisors, uh, particularly, or advisors and, and I would say, um, experts in these areas, uh, particularly in the clinical community and, the, and, uh, and other um, expertise uh, around how to commercialize. Um, a lot of discussion with, uh, particularly at HBI and Innovate Calgary, I should say. Uh, we really worked to try and engage the community and stakeholders. So that we recognize that this is, uh, this is a problem in this space and something that we're really working on uh, to move forward. And we partnered with um, Castex Ventures, um, who have brought a lot of the business and the finance expertise. And by a lot, I should say almost all, um, because they've really been excellent partners to try to help us navigate uh, some of these uh, uh, some of these challenges that have come up <clears throat> with um, moving toward the clinic. And so then in 2021, we founded uh, Aphiotics. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we're trying to bring a new treatment option to the clinic to help communities and families. So that's really the, the bottom line. Um, to be honest, though, academia really doesn't have the capacity or the resources to translate it. Um, just giving the, the high costs of, of, of things like clinical trials and really the people to support all of these, all of these different efforts. So, um, one of the kind of the elephant in the room, I think that we also have to address is that we wanna make an impact, but uh, to be honest, the opioid industry is really viewed negatively uh, because to be frank, they're, they're, mo they're quite responsible for uh, creating a lot of the opioid uh, uh, crisis and epidemic. 
And so this is something that we are really working toward to try and engage the community um, and understanding more how to do this in a way that uh, meets the needs of, of patients in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way uh, while trying to, to move this forward. And so we need investors to move any therapy to the clinic. And so, you know, need strategies for how to do that. Uh, bringing IP into the company and, and trying to navigate future IP strategies is actually something we don't have a lot of experience with and we really needed um, help from, uh, from people with the business side. Uh, funding to hire the people and the IP costs. Again, these are, these are major costs that need to be, be covered in order to move forward. Um, so, you know, some of the things we just didn't really know about before, like a unanimous shareholders agreement, you know, investors want to see it. And we, you know, if you, if you don't know what it is, or you don't really have a very good agreement, this really hurts your chances of getting funded. Or what does a business plan actually look like? Or what does a data room look like? You know, these are all questions that investors have asked us. And we, um, we're much more competitive when we actually know that, um, that understand how to do this properly. And so, very recently, Affiotics finished in a top 10 at an investor summit at, uh, at, a, at where investors come with um, to meet scientists and essentially try to uh, develop partnerships in order to try to move these technologies forward. So um, we didn't quite finish in the, in the, or we didn't finish quite as high as we'd like, but in the top 10, we're still very, very proud of that. I can see I'm almost out of time here, so I'll really quickly uh, wrap things up. Um, the Affiotics team, so next slide. Uh, we've grown to have diverse expertise in business, medical expertise, and clinical trials, as well as experts in, in people that, um, to connect with the community and stakeholder relations. This is something that's really important. And then the core of the science is really, you know, we've recognized the core of the science is really important, you know, but it's really only one component of what it takes to get all the way to the clinic. And so we're, we're working on filling in uh, those other parts. And then last slide, uh, huge thanks to OP, uh, HBI for their support. Of course, Campus Alberta Neuroscience for helping provide some of the funding that helped allowed us to help develop some of these new compounds. Uh, U of C and Faculty of Science, uh, of course, we're all faculty, so we appreciate having a, a job while we're trying to develop these things. Castex for helping us to get off the ground and, you know, and the Affiotics team for, for allowing us to get on this exciting journey. And so thanks again uh, and, uh, for this opportunity. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions now or during the, the panel discussion. Thanks, Darren. Uh, we do have a question that ha has come in from Sarah and it's been upvoted a little bit. It's also on my mind. Sarah says, do you have major pushback from the opioid community? And I think maybe even to focus that is, how do you stay focused when there's noise coming from many corners of this crisis? Um, so pushback from the opioid community, I'm not quite sure. What, do you mean uh, like patients in general um, or the opioid industry? Yeah, I think maybe let's generalize it to you're probably hearing different things that are sometimes um, centered in certain political views or investment views. How do you um, how do you handle any sort of pushback or uh, controversial approaches to what you're trying to do? Right. Yeah. So I can also see the comment, comment popped up about industry. So, um, you know, we haven't had, I would say, um, direct pushback from from the opioid industry um i would say per se but you know, i think that i think the entire world including the opioid industry recognizes that there's a problem that needs to be addressed um so we haven't come up to a lot of major pushback at this stage i would say um and i would say from the actual community um i'm not sure if i would call it um, pushback but i think there's very real acknowledgement that you know trying to, you know, this is not just another drug problem that can be solved with another drug. Um, you know, there are, there are multifacets to how to address um, opioid use disorder, including logical um, effects or uh, you know, what are the, the systemic reasons of why opioid um, use disorder is happening in the first place. So there it is a very complex problem. This is not simply something that can be solved. What we are working toward is to try to develop another tool that physicians would have uh, available to them to treat people under the under the right circumstances um, to overcome this this major problem. So that's um, the perspective that we take, and our goal, of course, is to get something to people. Um, 
you know, I would say that that has to be done with the help of industry. So there's a absolutely a delicate balance that we need to try to walk, and we're we're doing our best to walk. And um, because we need the resources of industry in order to ever get anything to the clinic, that's just the simple reality of drug development in in modern times. I would say. So hopefully that answers Sarah's question, but I'd be happy to discuss further um, at another point as well. Yeah, Darren, I think we'll leave it there. We went a little over time only because we started late and you're coming back for the panel discussion in about 40 minutes to an hour. It's possibly something that we can dive into with the entire panel, just sort of that pressure from different groups or, or you know, everyone's interest at stake. So uh, Dr. Dirksen, thank you so much. We're gonna move on and then we'll uh, possibly revisit some things in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we are going to change gears a little bit and speak on a topic or hear from a to on a topic uh, that's really close and near to my heart. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Wendy Muse. Wendy Muse wears multiple hats. She is an entrepreneur, business designer, coach, strategist, facilitator, and mentor. Wendy is a provider and the founder of Breast Buds, a platform connecting those with breast cancer to valuable resources and peers, reducing the isolation and loneliness experienced during cancer. With that, I welcome Wendy to the stage. Thank you so much. Morning, everyone. Let's wait for my slides. <clears throat> Next slide. One of the most difficult experiences in the last couple of years has certainly been the isolation. I'm very confident that many of you have felt loneliness in the last 12 months. And what I'm gonna do now is ask you to take a moment and recall that feeling of loneliness, even if it's just a tinge of what you once felt. Now I want you to imagine that feeling compounding for days, weeks, and months on end. Of course, most of us are beginning to return to what we would consider our normal lives and getting the reprieve of visiting friends and family, going to events, getting to travel and, and connecting. But there is a large portion of our community that still can't even go to the grocery store to get the essentials. That's why I'm here today. And that's why I want to talk about how helpful breast buds is. Next slide. My name is Wendy Muse, and I am the founder of Breast Buds, and I'm also a provider. In 2017, I became a provider when I had a preventative double mastectomy. At that time, I learned just how costly and isolating the impacts of breast cancer can be to the women with whom it affects. And make no mistake, it is a significant portion of our population. Once I started really understanding how lonely I felt when I couldn't connect with other people because none of my friends had had a preventative surgery at 31, my friends were worrying about having kids and getting married. And I was worrying, would the ticking time bomb on my chest kill me? That isolation led me to seek support, logically, from what I thought would be my peers. And it was during that time, I learned that people who are impacted by breast cancer are often relegated to spaces like public forums such as Facebook groups to try to find support from other patients and their peers. In fact, at the time of my surgery, I started researching a lot about what was going on. Next slide. And that research led me to understand first, I wasn't inept in tech, 
there were no platforms for breast cancer patients to connect with peers in either the Apple or Google Play Store. I found this incredulous. I, I couldn't imagine that as I lay there, I, I couldn't connect and talk to someone. And it didn't go great. Not surprisingly, if I had the genetics that got me to a place where I was recommended to have a preventative surgery, chances are I don't have great genes. And one of the things I learned from that was that the autoimmune disease I had, Sjogren's, was going to continue to cause failures in my surgery. Despite having what I think, and arguably many people in the community think, is one of the best plastic surgeons in the world, Claire Temple Overly, and certainly that I could ever have working on me, my surgery failed five times in six months. During that time, I used everything I learned during my business degree and MBA to start researching and understanding the problem and what some of the solution might be. The identified gap led to breast buds. Next slide. Our proprietary software, which connects those impacted by breast cancer to relevant resources, supports, and most importantly, their peers. Our platform, uses relevant psychosocial data from peers to support AI technologies and developing peer-guided supports and resources that are guided using clinical best practices. Something Facebook will always fall short of. Next slide. We use human-centered design thinking as our guiding framework to design a tool that will deliver agency to women at a moment when it feels the most snatched away. There is no gray area. The negative impacts of social media platforms in relationship to misinformation is egregious. The risk for patients to find misinformation on Facebook or such public forums where patients are often sent to meet is very high. That misinformation is exacerbated by the reach with which it goes unchecked. But like many, you might ask, how do you mitigate that risk? <laughs> Are you gonna control Facebook? Especially from my perspective, when 56% of Canadian women facing mastectomy surgeries live three plus hours away from a treatment center. So they can't easily come in for a meeting. They are more likely to seek out support and information using online platforms. Next slide. We recognize that these are some of the barriers that we're going to continue to face as we go forward. And there's also very little consideration given to a bevy of things that really influence a patient's experience. Little consideration is often given to representation. Again, something I experienced firsthand and then subsequently did a considerable amount of research around to understand, was I alone in that experience? We've done hundreds of interviews with potential users. And again, slide, something that truly informed that design and the thought of, of how would we deliver and acquire relevant information for patients was priority. My number one complaint, Jackson Pratt James, number two complaint, the amount of forms I have to fill out constantly every time I go see my doctor, every time I do something, I'm giving information and I get very little back. So we provide information back that delivers agency to people when they're trying to learn what's happening. Slide. That concept truly informed our design to ensure that we're delivering the most relevant data to individualized users. For example, if a member joined our platform and their ancestral background was Caucasian, the aggregate data of peers would only filter to include Caucasian if that was something of relevance 
based on clinical information. It is also often relevant with product or support information. The type of cream someone might represent or recommend, the hair product someone might, might recommend would definitely change between hair types, for example. So we wanna consider that as we provide information forward to people, being considerate of, you don't need more useless noise. <laughs> Slide. This development allows us to help us match our users based on what matters to them individually. Now, <laughs> some of you think, might think this sounds novel and you might even be skeptical. Uh, that's okay. That's a challenge I faced a lot during the last two years as we developed this not so simple solution. It's taken years to design with users because our first priority in design thinking is people. It is human-centered design thinking. We put people at the forefront of the decisions we're making. Because do you know who experiences cancer? People. And not just patients. We include supports for the people who are supporting patients throughout their time with cancer. This is a very complex solution that is delivered with the user's needs considered first. Next slide. For example, research tells us that dashboards can help patients with comprehension and their competencies around understanding of disease, which more formally people might consider patient education. So we designed our platform with patient education in mind. On our platform, when someone rates their pain, our platform will aggregate the pain scores of their peers and give them feedback. Claire, great news, you rated your pain 78. Most people at your time rate their pain 85. You're doing great, keep up the recovery. Or Claire, you've rated your pain 88 at a time when most people rate their pain 70. Maybe this is a good time to check in on what might be causing this additional pain. We're not providing clinical information to people. We're providing clinically, best, clinically grounded best practices. We use what I would consider to be the guide of having your best friend as a nurse in all of the disciplines in which you're gonna encounter over the next 24 months as you go through your cancer treatment. Next slide. During the pandemic, researchers found that survivors reported a 30% higher loneliness rating than their peers in the general public. And I, I would like to think in a room full of people where I'm clearly the least qualified, uh, the reason that that growth in loneliness is so obvious is because for the last two years, the resources patients might have sought out have potentially become life-threatening options for them. So when someone presents with a lump, she waits because the hospital is full of people dying from the pandemic. When someone presents with a, a sore, she waits, a rash, she waits. She doesn't talk to people. She doesn't want them to worry. She can't be around other people because of the risk. And that creates a lot of just bubble around someone at a time when they need connection. When we proposed a private platform, chat platform for folks, we were able to get hundreds, sorry, hundreds of people to sign up for our platform within a week. We then went to partners and partnered with great organizations like BRCA Strong, Young Adult Cancer Canada, and the Canadian Mental Health Association so that we could grow our access to people and give them what they need. This has allowed us to have a queue of tens of thousands of potential users to join our platform. The demand for private chat has been so significantly, sorry, has been so significant as we've been developing our tools that we've changed our website to include private chat, which will launch later this month so that patients can connect while we continue to develop out our tools. Next slide. This isn't a new model. Patients who are undergoing recovery for addiction 
are often paired with a mentor or a sponsor, someone who's been through this experience and has an idea of the road that lies ahead of you. Why have we not transferred that to other illnesses? And, and how do we continue to evolve to deliver to patients and, and individuals in a way that, that meets the needs of an ever-changing environment? Well, first, we do it by delivering meaningful connection to peers and, and when it matters the most. So our tool most easily summed up would be like Match or Tinder for breast cancer patients, except it's unlikely people are gonna date. They're just gonna match with people who are going through a situation similar to what they're going through and from a similar background based on what the user feels is important. I didn't want to hear from people who had children when I was going through my recovery. And I didn't want that during aftercare because I had very different concerns. I was the child of someone who didn't realize how to mitigate the risk for cancer. Because at 31, I became basically the oldest woman in my family. All the women before me had had breast cancer by 25, and all of them had died from cancer, breast cancer, or another cancer that they had developed as a result. Next slide. It's also important to create places where connections can reduce and mitigate the stress people feel. We know that connection mitigates anxiety and depression in patients. Next slide. Supporting patient agency also comes with education by giving people tools so that they can plan for what's coming and know how to work around that stress. Next slide. And in the reduction of that stress, we have the opportunity to remove the uncertainty experienced by the majority of women facing breast cancer mastectomy surgeries. I'd like to take a moment to thank the folks who've really been instrumental in getting us thus far. As you might have noticed, or maybe you haven't, but surely you have. I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Uh, but uh, I do have a lot of clinical experience. It's, it's just from the patient perspective. I spent six months in foothills, almost consecutively understanding and learning about what happens to patients when they're going through breast cancer because the folks around me, they were going through breast cancer. And in that time, I really, really understood how important it would be to explain to folks before the importance of what we could deliver in terms of alleviating some of the mental distress people feel People will ask questions like, how do you monetize that? How are you gonna get how are you gonna get people to pay for this? And when I tell them patients aren't gonna pay for it, they get really shook about this whole concept. And then I tell them, don't you think cancer is expensive enough to a woman? Why would we ask her to pay more? The survivor population the rate is 95% five-year survival of breast cancer. That's incredible. Researchers have made incredible progress. And in that effort, we ought to be recognizing there are other things we need to progress along, like the psychosocial supports for people going through cancer. I'd like to thank Campus Alberta Neuroscience for helping us in both direction and support to understand the impact that this tool could really have in reducing some of the impacts felt, especially in rural Canada. I would also like to thank WeSTEM. It's an organization in Southern Alberta that focuses on women in STEM, and they have been incredible in supporting us along the way. And then my team. They're incredible people who spend countless hours trying to solve a problem that none of us have experienced firsthand because I'll never have breast cancer. It's literally how this all started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing your lived experience and an experience that helped inform the creation of Breast Buds. It's so important to create safe spaces online for peer support. So I, I applaud you for that. Uh, we have some questions that have come up from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in. short because I thought there would be questions. Yes. So. 
So we have a question from Renee Dumas. Uh, how does breast buds engage with the trans and male communities who are also affected by breast cancer? So when we first started developing, when I first started developing this, one of the doctors who uh, I worked with regularly, Dr. Hadal El Hadi, we discussed right away the importance. I'm a member of the LGBTQ community, and one of the first things I recognized was it is overwhelming for the folks who join the chat rooms on Facebook when everything is she and her. But it is a bias. It is a bias just like breast cancer impacts women of color more than it affects Caucasian women. But most of the information provided out to folks is based on the Caucasian experience. That's not relevant and it's not helpful for patients when they're trying to solve immediate things like rashes and scabs and sores and burns and the actual things that genuinely ruin your day-to-day -day cancer tribulations. Thank you for that. I guess breast cancer doesn't see gender um, and many other things. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, what skills do you think coming from a background outside of medicine, as you indicated, helped you make breast buds such a powerful tool? Sure. So, sorry, just to finish that last one, we have, um, because of uh, just the broad community that we serve, there's gender diversity in the selection you can choose and the audience with which you want to belong to. So in the same way, uh, people of color can only request information from people of color. People who are transitioning can re request information from people who are transitioning. Mm -hmm. Testosterone would certainly impact the way this would affect someone. Um, so my background is actually in tech. I, um, my very first project at a university went from an idea to a $121 million IPO in 18 months, but it was high fashion. And I don't know if you can read this, mostly not high fashion. <laughs> So I recognized right away, this was not how I wanted to be spending my time. Visual recognition technology and worked with a company doing wound care, which really got me into the M health space and understanding how people like me who understand how to use technology to solve problems or reduce, mitigate the pain points of problems should really be invested in working with folks who are trying to solve these problems mm -hmm. because we know the gap that we are missing. And so I started working with uh, that team with um, uh, Health Outcomes Worldwide. We worked on a project with UFC. We created a, a platform around surgical site infection. And so I really understood first some of the campus compliance, but then that also a lot of what I was trying to get to was a psychosocial thing. And in terms of creating a community, developing a community, some of the barriers you might have if you have a great scientific idea, but you need to move that forward into a monetizable idea, we were able to do that in the reverse order. We were able to take in the considerations of, I recognize people on Facebook are putting clinically private information in those chats. So how do we be more ethical about that given Facebook is Oh, did we have, are we having some trouble? Okay, I think we lost, um, we lost Wendy there, but uh, we will be inviting her back for the panel discussion. So we'll be able to hear a little bit more from her at the end. I will pass it over to Jordan to introduce us. Sell us products, not deliver us what we need. Thank you, Wendy. Sorry that um, the last bit there cut off a bit, but uh, we will invite you back into the panel discussion at the end and uh, look forward to continuing our conversation there. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Wendy. Appreciate your attention. I'll pass it over to Jordan. Two years have taught us how to be adaptable to every <laughs> Pick up, small or large. Wendy, thank you so much. So inspirational to hear you talk uh, and looking forward to bringing her back to the panel discussion uh, right after we speak with uh, Dr. Adam Curtin. He is our third presenter in session one. Dr. Curtin is a professor of pediatrics, radiology, and clinical neurosciences at the University of Calgary and an attending pediatric neurologist at the Alberta Children's Hospital. He holds the Dr. Robert Haslam Chair in Pediatric Neurology and serves as the Deputy Head Research for the Department of Pediatrics, 
Dr. Curtin's research focuses on applying technologies, including neuroimaging, non-invasive brain stimulation, and brain computer interfaces to measure and modulate the response of the developing brain to early injury in order to generate new therapies and opportunities for life participation for disabled children. He served as the inaugural board chair and vice president of the International Pediatric Stroke Organization, and Dr. Curtin directs the Calgary Pediatric Stroke Program, Alberta Perinatal Stroke Project, the University of Calgary Non-Invasive Neurostimulation Network, and the ACH Brain Computer Interface Laboratory. Dr. Curtin, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jordan, and uh, hello, everyone. Sorry for that long bio. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thanks for inviting me. And um, I assume someone's gonna start my slides for me. Um, uh, it's, I really like the diversity of this uh, session and uh, thanks to uh, Darren and Wendy. Um, you'll see that what I'm gonna talk about is totally different again. Uh, although I think there's some common ground. I think Darren talked about taking neuroscience and turning it into you know, real world applications and I really liked Wendy's uh, patient-centered focus. It, it really resonates with what we're trying to do in our world. And uh, so hopefully we find some, some common themes there. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about our BCI for Kids program. Uh, this is a uh, relatively new, but uh, a rapidly growing um, program based here at the Children's Hospital that we're really excited about. Um, we've, uh, partway through, I'll show you, we've received some great recent uh, support, uh, including from uh, Campus Alberta Neuroscience, so very happy to share it with this crowd today. Uh, next slide, please. So, and just click for the next picture. Um, so I'm going to show you, tell you stories about some real patients, uh, real young people that we work with here uh, at ACH, and this is Peyton. Um, Peyton's one of our BCI superstars, and uh, She's um, a teenager and you can probably tell from the picture, she has a very severe neurological disability. She uh, has quadriplegic cerebral palsy and that means that she can't really use her hands, she can't walk and she can't speak, um, but she's a lovely uh, young woman, very aware and socially interactive, um, has all sorts of um, uh, capacity and potential but it's been a very, uh, very hard for her to realize that because of her physical disability. And what you're seeing on the right is an MRI scan. And, and I won't show you lots of brain pictures today, but the point of the MRI is it actually looks almost normal. Um, there's a couple of bright spots that you might make out. Those are small strokes that she had near birth that have damaged the, the motor system, the movement system of her body. Um, that, and that is what uh, has led to her disabilities. But all the rest of the brain is is uh, very healthy and, and um, all the higher functions in our brains that, that make us who we are, personality and, and uh, other things, uh, live mostly in those areas. And, and so um, uh, our goal in this program is to, is to help young people like Peyton to realize their full potential and use all those healthy parts of their brain uh, when they're being, um, uh, they have a limited ability to do so because of their physical disability. Uh, next slide. I'll tell you what the picture means at the end. Um, so I don't have any disclosures other than I'm going to talk about um, um, today just BCI neurotechnologies. These are all experimental, so I'm not making any sort of therapeutic recommendations. And I'll touch on it. We do have a, a variety of commercialization interests that are in development, uh, but no conflicts of interest that I need to disclose uh, today. Thanks. Next slide. So I have three learning objectives. I realize this is a diverse audience, so I'm gonna to try to give you some uh, basic understandings. First, about injury uh, in young people, brain injury in young people that occurs around birth. That's a cause of cerebral palsy. I'll get you comfortable about what that means. But then show you how patients like Peyton and, and other patients who have cerebral palsy, um, uh, there are these huge gaps in what, in what we're trying to do to help them with neurotechnology, specifically BCI, which are brain computer interfaces, which I'll explain. And then tell you uh, lastly about this uh, patient-centered program that we've developed to try to realize the potential of BCI for, for such young people. Uh, next slide. So first, uh, a bit about cerebral palsy. So many would probably know, but just to be clear, cerebral palsy is not one disease. It's a variety of brain injuries that you're born with, and they lead to lifelong physical disability, difficulty moving your body. 
Uh, that's a, a really a practical definition of cerebral palsy. And as you can see from the cartoon on the right, there are different forms. So sometimes it affects one side of the body, sometimes more the legs. And in its most severe form, it affects the entire body, uh, both sides, arms, legs, and, and, and all the muscles in our body. Uh, obviously a very difficult uh, condition to live with. Next slide. And so again, I, you don't have to learn about MRI today. The point of these three MRIs is to tell you there are some pretty predictable patterns of injury that we now, thanks to MRI, we now understand. And if you look at the, I'm sorry, I can't point at these slides, but if you look at the three pictures, the one on your left, you'll see a big hole on one side of the brain. That's a stroke, perinatal stroke. This is uh, a big area of focus for us. If you move to the middle picture, you'll see the arrows pointing. There's something wrong deep in the middle on both sides of the brain. This is what happens to a lot of premature children. They have an injury to the white matter. And on the right-hand picture, you'll see an arrow pointing to some bright spots just in the deep middle parts of the brain. This is a problem that happens usually to term babies who are deprived of blood and oxygen at birth. The details aren't too important. It's just to say that we now have a really good understanding of why cerebral palsy happens, and we have these beautiful pictures and maps of the brain to understand why a person has physical disability, why they grow up with cerebral palsy, but also what else is going on in their brain. We can now see all the parts of the brain, and how could we ever tap into those healthier parts, those parts that are still working really well? Uh, that's really what BCI is about. Next slide. So if we come back to those patterns that I showed you a minute ago, we're gonna focus on the, um, the right-hand side for BCI application, but first I'll tell you about the left-hand side, that is the, the one-sided or hemiplegic cerebral palsy. Next slide. And as I just showed you, this is usually due to perinatal stroke. A stroke is a blockage of a blood vessel in the brain, leads to a, a focal injury. And if you wanna know more, this is a nice review article from Mary Dunbar in our group um, that shows you there are actually a variety of, of vascular brain injuries that happen near birth. Uh, many of which result in this form of cerebral palsy. Next slide. And these colorful pictures are, are just to give you a feel for the tools we have available these days to understand how a young brain develops after such a focal injury. And the details aren't important, but we can measure differences in brain structure. We can measure connections between areas of the brain. We can measure brain activity when you do something. We can measure brain chemistry. Um, incredible tools that our center and others um, have, have great capacity for. The point for today is that these tools are letting us understand uh, and build individualized maps of brain development after early injury. And you'll see in a minute why that's important. Next slide. We also do things like non-invasive brain stimulation. This is a, a called a TMS robot in our lab. And it can go around and actually map out the, the motor pathways in your brain while you sit and watch a movie uh, uh, on our big screen. And we have uh, young children, as you can see in the picture, are able to do this. The color map on the right is actually showing the representation of an individual muscle in that child's hand, how it's activated by this type of stimulation in the brain, just contributing to the depth of these, these maps of brain development. Uh, you can skip to the next slide. And again. And so we have these increasingly informed models, we call them. That's what these color cartoons are showing. This is a review article we just published for those who want to learn more. And the point is that we're getting really pretty smart about uh, understanding um, where that potential is, which are the areas of the brain that are driving function in, in young people with cerebral palsy and early injury. Um, how is the brain developed around these injuries at the beginning of life? Next slide. And so uh, we've had an interest in neurotechnologies for a long time, and this started with brain stimulation, like the TMS mapping in the robot I just showed you. It includes other things like, this is an, a picture, some pictures of another form of brain stimulation called transcranial direct current stimulation. This may have the potential to actually enhance brain function or at least help the brain learn faster, which is, which is what we're usually doing with therapy. And what you can see here is a group of kids. These kids all had strokes at birth. They all have cerebral palsy on one side and they're participating in one of our clinical trials. Next slide. And we've actually taken this all the way to phase three multi-center trials. And this is a snapshot from our summer camps that we run. We're gonna be finishing this trial this year. Finally, and we've been delayed because of COVID. But what it's showing is how you can take a neurotechnology, in this case, brain stimulation, and try to test it and study it in real groups of children with the problem you're trying to fix. And um, we have this amazing participation from kids and families. They buy in, 
They come to these camps, really intensive uh, training and all sorts of MRI scans and other things. Um, and we're very excited to see the results of uh, this trial, which will finish uh, this year. Next slide. So back to Peyton. So that's that's stroke. And if you click the button again, please. If you remember the MRI I showed you, it has those little bright spots. Those are also strokes. But the big difference for Peyton is that she had strokes on both sides of her brain. Most of the kids I've shown you so far, just one side. So they have a physical disability, but they're able to, to walk and run and, 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 and really move in the world, so to speak. Peyton can't do that because her strokes are on both sides. So she has, next slide, she has quadriplegic cerebral palsy, all four limbs. And uh, there's that cartoon again. And this, when this condition is in its most severe form, it is very analogous to something called the locked-in syndrome. This occurs in, in adults with other types of neurological problems. But it means you're a person who's, who's got no ability to walk or use their hands and often no ability to, to speak or, or maybe communicate at all but you're a very conscious and aware person. Just You can just look in this young boy's eyes and see he's a, a beautiful smile. He's obviously very, uh, very aware and, and socially interactive, but his physical disability creates huge barriers for him to interact with the world. And so this is the problem I'll, I'll focus on for the rest of the talk. Next slide. So this uh, locked-in uh, syndrome uh, occurs in, for a variety of reasons, and there are many amazing stories out there, uh, and I'm, I'm going to share a few of our Calgary stories. But if you want to read an amazing book, this is Jonathan Bryan's work. He's a young boy in the UK um, whose parents didn't even know what he was capable of, couldn't communicate till he was about nine, and then a smart speech pathologist figured out a way for him to communicate with his eyes. That's what's being shown in the picture on the left. He wrote this book with his mom and it writes, um, there, there's a verse here uh, that he wrote. Um, he's a beautiful writer. Um, he's still just a teenager. Um, it's an amazing book of this whole um, uh, uh, concept and story that I'm gonna tell you if you're interested in, in reading a personal account. Next slide. And um, what this really relates to, we think is a, a fundamental human rights issue. And so, uh, this is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. There's another convention on, on uh, the rights of children. It really speaks to this need for more research, more effort to take science, take technology and apply it to these big problems. And you can see this um, uh, um, convention has been ratified across the world, including even Russia, who obviously doesn't care much about human rights, uh, even agrees with uh, uh, policies like this. Um, and it really behooves us to try things like, like we're trying, and um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Next slide. You can click again, please. So to our second objective then, what is uh, BCI and what are these gaps that we're trying to fill with this uh, emerging technology? Next slide. Click again. So a brain-computer interface, you have to use your imagination a little bit here. It sounds a bit science fiction-y, but the concept is actually pretty straightforward. So if you look at the cartoon on the right, what a BCI does is it samples your brain activity. So we can put a cap on your head, measure your brain waves, and in real time, we can look at your brain waves, which in all of us are changing from moment to moment. And if we then get you to intentionally change your brain waves, which I, all of us could do it right now, if you just start thinking about opening and closing your left hand, just like the cartoon is showing you, it will produce a very reproducible change in your brain waves. And we can even predict where that will occur and what it will look like. If you send that information continuously to a smart computer, it could very quickly learn, oh, I can see what, let's say Jordan's doing this, it could say, oh, I can tell when Jordan is, is thinking about his left hand. And now I can tell when he's not thinking about his left hand. We tell him to do that a few times, we teach the computer, and after a few minutes, the computer could learn to recognize that, so much so that Jordan could then, if he was hooked up from that computer to a device, make that device do something just by thinking about his left hand. So hopefully that concept is, is clear. Let me show you an example. Next slide. So BCIs um, work on that fundamental principle. There are all sorts of ways to measure the brain activity continuously. I'm going to show you how we do it non-invasively with, with EEG or sensors on the surface of the head. If you want really good information, you can put sensors inside the brain. This is obviously a much bigger uh, process, but there are ways to do both. Next slide. So the idea of reading brain activity directly from inside the brain has been around for several decades. And this is amazing work from uh, friends of ours, Lee Hochberg and others, 
who have pioneered this work over the last 20 plus years. These are paralyzed adults for different reasons who have little chips, little sensors in their brains. And what these uh, uh, studies have shown is that you can learn using that kind of sensing to control devices. The woman on the right is able to take a drink from her water bottle using a robotic arm just by thinking about what she wants that arm to do. Next slide. And I'll skip this one. Next slide. And this is the modern state of BCI. And sorry for the busy slide, but you won't even believe it when I tell you, but what it's showing you are three emerging studies from leading edge uh, groups. Top left, Eddie Chang's work from UCSF is showing that we can put sensors on the surface of the brain and actually extract the elements of speech, so much so that someone could think about the words they wanna say and a computer could say them. This is uh, this study that they recently published uh, is, is proof of that possibility. The study on the right uh, from Krishna Shinoi shows the same idea except thinking about handwriting, thinking about letters in individual letters, patients are spelling it out uh, using, a, in this case, an implanted brain computer interface. And in the bottom left, you'll see a monkey playing Pong on a computer. Some of you may have caught this on the news. This is Elon Musk's company called Neuralink, who have developed a, a whole new way perhaps to, to extract really detailed information from the brain and first in human trials are expected soon. So this field is booming, uh, which is very exciting. Next slide. But the problem is there's no work being done in children and in, in the conditions that affect children like cerebral palsy, which I taught you about at the beginning. And so if you look at the triangle on the right, what we see is there's a real gap. There's incredible science, neuroscience, computer engineering, biomedical engineering, building these BCIs, but there's this big gap between all of this scientific progress and the kids who might actually benefit. And if you just click the button there, you'll see, just click, yeah. So this is the gap that we, we are trying to fill. So we're a group more of pediatric clinicians, neuroscientists who think we can fill this gap. And the, the data on the left is showing you, if you look at all the registered trials out there in the world using brain computer interface, the numbers are going up over time, but there's still a very, very small minority focused on children. So this is our gap that we're, that we're targeting. Next slide. And this is a study we did across Canada asking all the people who work with severely disabled people, what do you know about BCI and how useful do you think it would be? And the, the separation is shocking. Almost nobody understands what a BCI is or has even experienced it or thought about it. Yet when you explain the possibility, they see this enormous potential. That's what this study shows. So I think it shows we're on the right track, but we have a huge gap to fill. Next slide. So does this actually work in children? So we started asking some of these fundamental questions. Um, and if you can click the video here, if you can go on to the video, you'll, oops, uh, you need to go on to, go back please, yeah, back again. You need to put a cursor on the video, there you go, push play. So this is my son a few years ago. He's wearing on his head a very simple BCI system that's wireless. It's talking to a smart computer. And after about 10 minutes of training, we trained that computer to recognize an intentional brain activity that would make the car go. And now you can click the slide, thanks. So he was able to learn that quickly, very simple task, make a car go. But what this study showed in a, in a large group of school-age children is they're very good at it. They're about the same as adults, at least for doing very simple tasks like this. Next slide. So I'll finish then by just telling you more about the BCI for Kids program and where we think this is going. Next slide, please. So with that kind of basic understanding, we right away went um, to the clinical side and specifically to patients and families, those are, that is children who are affected by severe quadriplegia. And we invited them to participate, not, not even knowing really if this would work and not making any promises. But of course, these families are incredibly brave and resilient and, and, and with any opportunity for their children, they, they just jumped right in and they've been a huge patient partner. Um, they really are the core of our program and they, they get most of the credit for what's happened. And so what we've tried to do is as these technologies come, we try to, to build them and make them available so families can try to do things. And these individual uh, children can try to set some goals about things they want to do. And what I'm going to show you now are some more snapshots of some of the uh, simple but, but really quite meaningful activities that have been accomplished. So next slide. So uh, this is Nick and his family. He's one of our superstars. And if you click the video top left, you have to go on the video. Yeah, go ahead and click that. So there's Nick in the middle racing one of his brothers. So you can see they both have BCI and, oh, it's too bad you can't hear the audio. 
if you could hear the audio, you'd hear them screaming because they were so excited because one of them just beat the other one in the car race. You can click the bottom right video now. Here's Nick playing a video game, super simple video game. But he's, these are three young boys. They love video games. And in the past, Nick had to sit at home and watch his brothers play video games because they, they have hands that work. Here it's the opposite. So here they are in the BCI lab. They have to watch Nick play the game because only he knows how to do it. And so this is this is a real accomplishment, I think. Next slide. Click again, great. Uh, so BCI can also help kids communicate. You remember I said that most of these children are nonverbal. The top left is a young girl who's been locked in for many years. And what she, you can see on the board is a, is a keypad of numbers. And there are different ways to use BCI. You can see she's wearing a cap to detect her brain waves to try to let her spell words. And what's shown on the bottom right is a new spelling system that we've been developing with help of, of collaborators elsewhere. And you can see a young patient wearing a BCI cap trying to spell words. Now they can do it, uh, it's slow and not very efficient yet, but they can spell uh, sometimes several words per minute, which is an amazing accomplishment if you've never been able to spell or, or, or type text uh, before. Someday we wanna see kids texting with each other on, on social media. Uh, we still have a ways to go to get there. Next slide. And um, I'll, I'll pause here uh, briefly on a particular technology development. So I mentioned we're using a lot of available tech, but uh, the brilliant engineers in my program who I'll, I'll acknowledge at the end have been developing individual solutions. And this one's particularly worth mentioning because uh, it's called the Think to Switch device. And, and what it's designed to do is actually get a BCI system to talk to what are called switch devices, which are simple devices that people with severe disabilities often use to do meaningful things that are uh, usually sort of an on off or a yes, no type of signal. And there had never been a way to get all the BCIs out there to talk to switch devices. And so uh, uh, my brilliant team put this together. And I'm, I'm very pleased that we were awarded a, um, uh, a grant recently from ST Innovations, uh, uh, co-supported by Campus Alberta Neuroscience uh, to advance the thing to switch. And it's now in a much more rapid phase of development thanks to that support. And if you can click the video on the left here, you'll see one of our youngest patients. This is one of our newest patients. She's only five. She wanted to turn on the lights and turn on songs. She loves music, wants to play music. That's a switch. It's an on or an off. And it's a simple task for you and me, but it was something she could never do. And the thing to switch and, and our BCI systems let her do those things. So she's able to set a goal. And it's even if it's simple, it's something she can do independently herself. And, and she's now doing that. And so this is early, but we think very promising signs of, of this type of technology doing real things um, that matter to, to individual kids. Next slide. And click again. So the Think to Switch is also driving our power mobility program. So I'm gonna show you two videos here. Uh, this is Daniel, who's one of our uh, uh, superstars and a, a very um, bright and intelligent young boy who you can see has severe cerebral palsy. You can click the video, please. And this is him in his wheelchair. It's resting on what's called a trainer um, to allow him to train how to drive a wheelchair. He's making it move. You can see the BCI on his head. He's making it go forward by thinking a certain thought, doing a certain uh, BCI task. And you can see it's, it's sluggish, it's jerky, but you could also see the look on his face when he made it move. And if you can just click again, uh, you should, another video, yeah, okay, now you can play this, play the bottom right video, thank you. And this is Matei, another boy with cerebral palsy I've known since he was born, doing the same training. That's his mom. And you can see, you can see he's got all sorts of abnormal movements, but he's thinking, trying to get that thought right to make the, make the wheelchair go. And it's also jerky, not perfect yet. But you'll see in a sec here, he's going to almost run his mom over because he really makes it work. Um, so you can also see the fine tuning that we still have a long way to go. Uh, but you can see the potential and, and it's very um, exciting for these for these kids to do something on their own. Next slide. And so uh, I'll finish just a few other BCI applications. We, we are using this in our acute care uh, setting. This is in our pediatric intensive care unit where I do most of my clinical work. A variety of children who are in that locked in state very acutely, kids who were, who were normal the day before, uh, we've been able to use BCI on an experimental basis to try to help them connect with the world, do something. Um, and we're trying to develop a communication system to help that work in, in what are extremely scary circumstances. Um, I think we will see a lot of growth in that space as well. Next slide. 
And thanks to COVID and again, the brilliant team uh, of our engineers, we found ways to do BCI at home. And in fact, a lot of families are now setting goals and doing BCI tasks at home. Um, these are two of our BCI stars here. And uh, next slide. And this really relates again to patient-centered and uh, care and patient engagement. So we we really try to listen to the families. The families' engagement has been amazing. You'll see some some pictures here. Our families top left participating in the game jam. This is where they meet with game developers to try to come up with creative ideas for BCI gaming. You can see an online event we had with the whole team. Bottom right. Um, you can see the lab coats. There's John wearing his lab coat. So all the kids get a lab coat. They re they're BCI scientists in the program, so we give them a U of C lab coat, which many of them are proud to wear, and their siblings are too. And uh, next slide. And I've got a great little video clip here to finish with. I don't, is there no audio? I, I can't hear audio. I don't know if you guys can. Uh, but we'll, we can play it, and I can sort of, uh, oh, be able to try it with the audio. Hey, we are the Saparlos. I'm Kurt. This is John. Josie. Josie. And I'm Carly. And uh, we are in the BCI program. Uh, and when I say we, I mean John. He's been in the program for almost two years. He's eight now. John uh, was born with cerebral palsy, and it affects him a few different ways, but uh, he's physically limited, but he's cognitively very aware, and this is where BCI has allowed him to shine and uh, show some of uh, some of the things he's capable of. So uh, things that he enjoys doing is painting. We do a, a lot of paintings. Um, and uh, that's all with the power of his mind, and he's done... Uh, plays video games. He's uh, cars, and uh, it's just been an amazing journey. Uh, he gets better every time, and uh, we're excited to see where it takes him. So we're very fortunate to be a part of this amazing team. The mountain top, walk on water. I got power, feel so royal. One second. Great. Next slide. Thanks. I'm almost done um, for the time. So uh, skip this one and the next one. Great. So to finish up, um, uh, thanks to the Saparlos and John and uh, all the families for sharing their stories and videos. Um, I want to uh, just finish by mentioning where this is going. So this is a, a national Canadian uh, pediatric BCI network that we've been building and our colleagues, uh, especially in Toronto and Edmonton, um, have been uh, huge partners. Next slide. And we're really seeing this grow. You can skip through the uh, animations here. Sorry. Thanks. Um, really seeing this grow across the country um, and into some leading U.S. centers um, and national partnerships that we're hoping are going to uh, grow these applications uh, um, and accelerate them. Next slide. Great. So I'll finish by coming back to Peyton, who has been one, was one of our first participants and continues to be a, an active participant. Um, one of her favorite tasks, as you saw John doing, is, is doing these paintings with BCI and click again. Uh, so the picture I showed you at the beginning was her winning the HBI uh, Smart Art competition uh, recently. Uh, usually it's grad students uh, and uh, who win these awards. Peyton won it. She's extremely proud, and we were very proud of her. Uh, just one uh, great uh, uh, example of goal achievement. Next slide. Uh, these are some quotes from the families, which I would usually leave up at the end. Um, uh, uh, Ziana Jadavi uh, did much of the work. Uh, she's a med student now. Uh, but did it during her PhD. She interviewed all the families and their uh, their opinions and their views are extremely insightful. Um, uh, and that will be published soon. Next slide. And so if you want to know more about the program, this is the website bciforkids.com. And you can see the social media links there if you want to follow along. And last slide, I think. Thanks to my team. Uh, I don't have time to introduce everybody, but especially the, the, the core of the BCI team it's our diversity, I think, that makes us strong. So it's not just a bunch of brilliant biomedical engineers, computer science people, but also clinicians, occupational therapists, graduate students, postdocs, and other types of uh, uh, diverse um, people with diverse backgrounds. And uh, thanks again to, to all of our funding, but in particular to uh, ST and Campus Neuroscience um, for the support.
and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Dr. Curtin, thank you so much. Uh, you can hear me okay now? Yep. Gotcha. All right. Let's jump right to some folks' questions. We'll spend about five minutes here, and then we'll open up to the entire panel discussion where you'll stay on, and uh, we'll be joined back with Wendy and Darren. Maribel asks, does it require consciousness, or does it function to translate brain waves, uh, the idea mm -hmm. being in sleep, unconsciousness, in a coma? Uh, are there yeah. other applications you're looking at? Yeah, thanks, Maribel. Good question. So uh, there's sort of two answers there. One is um, that the uh, the locked in sort of state that I described, um, you're right, is that that's a pressing issue in states of uh, coma or what we call disorders of consciousness. So uh, especially in the acute setting, I had one slide about the ICU applications, but um, there's actually two kids as we speak in Edmonton who are in a, in a some type of locked in state due to an acute neurological problem in their ICU. And so this ability to detect consciousness or provide communication for people in an acute state of altered consciousness, that is one potential application of BCI that we're interested in. The other way to answer your question is to think about what level of consciousness or capacity does a young person need to have to do this? Um, certainly, as I mentioned, some of the kids with long-term quadriplegic cerebral palsy, some of them are highly intellectually capable, completely normal. Some are, are, are gifted. Um, and so uh, they have a, a, a full consciousness, conscious awareness, in, in depending on how you define the term. Um, they're obviously v have great potential to use BCI. But what we're also learning is true is there are kids, of course, most of these kids have very severe brain problems. And so some of them do have in, impairments of their awareness, their um, IQ, their cognitive capacities. But we're learning that um, even kids with quite significant developmental delays are still able to grasp the concept, use a BCI to do uh, things that matter to them, that give them quality of life. So when we started this, we wondered if it would be limited to only maybe the you know highest developmental level of children. Uh, but we're learning uh, younger children and kids with significant delays may still have potential. So, uh, so really good questions. Thanks. Another question, is there a critical window uh, during which interventions should or should not occur following perinatal stroke? Oh, yeah, very good question. I thought you were going to say about uh, BCI, but uh, well, it kind of applies to both. So there's a general concept that earlier is better, and it's true that Young, the younger your brain is, the more plastic it is or the more malleable it is to, to experience or training or, or therapy. We're pretty certain that's true in perinatal stroke and some of the stuff I briefly mentioned about brain stimulation and therapy. Um, we are trying to find ways to move that into the younger age range to take advantage of that plasticity that's there. The tricky part in, there is that it's probably maximal in the preschool age range, but you need safety, we, we're building up safety data, but you also need cooperation to do a lot of this stuff. And uh, some of the things we try in, you know, teenagers aren't, isn't going to work in a three-year-old, um, but we're working around that. It's probably true for BCI too, that we want to get kids in earlier because they learn faster. It's just like learning to play the piano or learn math at school. The, the earlier you start, the, the easier it is. So um, the, the earlier, the better is, is part of our philosophy for sure. All right. We'll go to one more question, then we'll open up to panel just so we stay on time and folks get to take a bit of a break before we turn the corner on session two. How do you plan to help people become more aware of BCI and, of course, its incredible potential? Yeah, uh, good question. So um, in a variety of ways, I think one of the biggest is the um, the network. I, I'm sorry I rushed through it, but I showed you that map of Canada and, and as we've been putting this out there in the scientific and the, and the clinical therapy communities, we get a lot of interest and, and partly because there's not a, often a lot we, that's already out there for, for kids with these conditions. And so people are quick to see the potential. And so um, we, we call that, most people know, knowledge translation. So once we, these lessons we're learning, we're trying to get it out there through presentations, scientific publications, social media, websites. The more we do that, we, we get a lot of interest. And so we're trying to figure out how to share that and build this network. And it touches a little bit on the commercialization streams, which I, which I know um, Darren talked about earlier and is, is one of the 
goals of, of Canvas Alberta Neuroscience. And we've been working with the university and, and other entrepreneurial and commercialization experts uh, still very early, but we think to see this truly scale and to drive technology uh, production and, and advancements uh, for children, which definitely is part of the part of the equation. Um, we think it's going to be a combination of clinical advancements, research, and probably commercialization that will scale and, and leverage this so that it um, it moves along faster and gets out to more uh, to broader populations. Sounds like a lot of work in many different areas, as we are all very familiar with in our own ways. <laughs> Adam, thank you. We're going to invite Wendy and Darren back. I'm going to take this chance just because it's it's inspiring. While we get Wendy and Darren back on, here's from the book, I Can Write. I found it on Amazon. Of course, it's available for purchase. A family of haikus. Listen to this. Um, imaginative. Playmate, soulmate, laughing, fun, pretty Susanna. Unconditional. Loving, singing, full of joy, cuddly Jemima. Intellectual, man time, cave time, peace of quiet, faithful daddy. Incomparable, mother, teacher, one with me, devoted mummy. Um, yeah, that's good. That's good. It's powerful work, Adam. It's incredible. <laughs> Well, those are those words, uh, Jonathan's words. I encourage you to read them. Um, mm -hmm. He's a he was a better writer than me when he was like ten years old. Uh, <laughs> right, he speaks brilliantly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got everyone here. I'm going to gather myself from just reading a simple haiku of inspiration. Um, I want to throw this question out to all of you. Adam, it's something you hinted at um, as you begun, just in admiration of both Darren and Wendy and, and the words that, uh, in both of their presentations. To all of you, how do you stay focused on the patient? There's a lot of noise and special interest likely coming at all three of you in your, in your corners of the world. How do you really stay focused on the patient? I'll let, uh, let's go in order. I'll let Darren go, then Wendy go, then Adam go. Sure, thanks. That's um, It's an interesting question. I think there are a lot of things pulling us in a lot of different directions, but I guess for me personally, I think personal um, interactions with friends and family who have kind of gone through these kind of things helps to keep it in context. Um, you know, that's really, I think, the the most, you know, maybe the one of the best motivators is to have a personal connection to to someone who's been affected by this and to hearing those stories. I think, you know, having that connection with, with patients and hearing about the kind of things they've gone through really makes it real. So I, that's probably what I would say. <clears throat> we, I talk to patients, to practitioners, to support agents, to people who have been failed in a system, uh, probably 40% of my time. So I'm always learning about what people's experiences are like because they're always different and it's important to recognize that. And then every morning I shower and that helps because the scars from a double mastectomy are pretty significant. And so most days I have a brief glimpse and reminder of what other folks are going through because I remember what happened. Yeah, and for me, um... I'm lucky in that it's part of my job. So I'm a clinician and so I, I encounter patients and families on a daily basis. And it's so it's sort of a constant reminder of and, uh, and an opportunity to learn from them. And, and, but in particular, the, the engagement element of, of research, we always tried to do that in our research programs. I showed you the brain stim stuff. We've been doing this for like almost 15 years. And I think we used to think we were good at patient engagement because, because, patients came and we worked with them and we talked to them, but it didn't really figure out what it was until the BCI program came along where we actually made them the core and we asked them to tell us what we should be doing and asked them to set the goals. And, um, and so I've, I've, I think I'm, I'm still probably not totally there, but I think I've learned a lot about what real patient engagement is. And, um, and so Practicing, putting that into practice has been has been really eye opening, and I think it's really driven the, the progress. Uh, fantastic! Just hints at connection, uh, being connected with the folks that uh, you work for. Um, how can I mean? There's a lot of in in each of your areas of expertise. There are a lot of um, 
words and call to action. And sometimes that becomes the noise without actual action coming to be. So how can the public support, or even our colleagues in neuroscience, um, come to support the growth of what you're doing in a way that pushes things forward in action in instead of just, you know, always being a call to something, but never moving it forward. I guess I can start again. Um, so for us, I, I think that, um, you know, having that that patient engagement and community engagement would be would be amazing. Uh, that's exactly what we would really benefit from. So, you know, if there are those who are interested on the call or otherwise that are connections that are available, we would definitely be very interested in hearing from them. <coughs> we can, uh, you know, make the right steps at the beginning so that we end up at the right place. I think that's that, that's what it would be for us. Anyway. Great question. Um, I just want to say uh, one of the things I find really interesting is I'm the counterpoint to the other folks wherever they are in the squares on the screen for you in the presentation. They are the people who really understand the clinical and the scientific side of what happened. And my lens is truly a user-informed lens. My experience is product development. I've developed multiple multi-million dollar projects in tech. So I know how to develop something and then adding human-centered design thinking to the core of every decision we're making means a patient first perspective is always what is guiding us. But I'm not a clinical expert. I'm always on the other side of the clinicians. I have consistently asked every doctor who I've met with over the last five years during my recovery from my surgeries about everything I can think of that is useful and helpful, but I am very much open to anyone who would like to work on our project. It's why I left my contact information up for so long. We would happy be happy to have folks from the neuroscience community join our program or join our platform and help us in developing a tool that really solves some of the patient problems that rely on mental health resources that just aren't there. Uh, so I'll add a couple perspectives. First, I think Wendy's underestimating her influence in that at least um, uh, from what I was just saying a minute ago, and I'm confident that it's true. It's not universal yet. It should be, but it, I'm confident it's true across as, as a clinician and a researcher. Um, the voice of people with lived experience, patients and families is uh, loud and, and valued and um, it for making things move, I think that is um, what is going to make things move. And I'll, I'll use a parallel example of, of Jonathan Bryan, whose book we keep talking about. I, I didn't mention, but he's become a powerful advocate for the education of, of children with severe disabilities. He has a nonprofit in the UK. He's all over social media. Um, and so, and it's it's his voice as a person with lived experience that carries all the weight. Like I could tweet a hundred times about how we should be uh, advocating for the rights of children with severe disabilities, um, it pales in in comparison to him saying it himself. Um, and the other source of support for growth, to your question, Jordan, is um, it, the community too. And I I, I was remiss in not uh, specifically pointing at the Children's Hospital Foundation and the community support that comes at least for our program. Um, they have been a huge backer, and that all comes from the community. And so um, we put it out there. We try to share the stories and 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 tell the, the, the broader community about why this is important and why it matters. And thanks to the foundation and the Calgary Southern Alberta community, the the buy-in and the, the the support, financial and otherwise, has been very strong. And you could not start a program like we've started, or in fact, most of my research programs, without that kind of community support. Um, it now needs to take a advantage of other things um, like research grants and commercialization to, to keep growing. Um, but the roots of it are in the community. And um, so that, that support is uh, invaluable. And, and, uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. To all three of you, thank you. We'll wrap it there. So we get back just a little bit on time, let folks to have uh, 10 or 12 minutes to just break before we start session two. Uh, to everyone who is taking part, I know there have been so many questions that have popped up that we just don't have time to get to. Uh, I think it's valid um, 
folks, if I can just say reach out to each of our presenters by email if they want to follow up. I know you've all made an offer of sorts for, for that continued conversation, but if it's just that someone really wanted their question answered and really wanted to get more to the bottom of what's going on, I think that's a valid offer that they can email each of you, Darren, Wendy, and Adam. Thank you so much. Uh, such a pleasure. What a great way to kick off the uh, this year's Successes in Neuroscience Symposium with you three folks. Thank you for taking your time uh, for this last hour and a half to, to spend it with us and share your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. We Thanks will be back great. with session two um, on time at one o'clock. We'll see everyone in the room then. Thank you. <laughs>